Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service today for Sunday, July 12th. Uh, when you are watching this, I will be on holidays. So I decided I would uh, dress in holiday garb. Plus, it's really quite hot in the church today. <laughs> um, but thank you for joining us, and we're really happy to have Ellen here, who will do the children's story. I'm um, really delighted that the Sunday School teachers and our youth pastor, uh, Maureen, made gift bags for the children for the month of July. And the theme is water, an appropriate one for this time of year. And uh, Ellen will speak a bit about that. So to begin, I'll just invite you to pray along with me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. And Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And I'm pleased to invite Ellen to come forward for the children's story. Hello, nice to be with you to celebrate today. And uh, we're continuing with our theme of water this month. And those of you who received a gift bag, an activity bag of things that have to do with water, and all the stories that we're including in the activity bag have to do with water. Maureen last week with Maya told the story about Jesus calming the sea. And this week, we're uh, going to take a story from the Old Testament, also about a sea, the Red Sea, and a man called Moses. So the Israelites lived in captivity in Egypt for about 400 years, and they were the slaves. They did all the hard work for the Egyptians, and it was hard, hard labor and a hard, hard life, and they asked God, they prayed to God, please save us, deliver us from this captivity. And so God heard their cry and he sent a man named Moses and his brother Aaron to talk to the leader of Egypt, uh, the Pharaoh, to let his people go. And the Pharaoh said, no, I'm not letting your people go because I need them to do all my slave work for me. So God sent plague after plague after misery after annoyance until finally the Pharaoh said, enough, I've had enough, you can go, please, please leave. I'll be happy to see you go. Just stop all this terrible plagues. So Moses took the people, they gathered up their belongings and they traveled and God took them on the journey. God led them on the journey. And he led them by day with a cloud, a huge cloud, through the desert. It was a hard, hot walk where water was scarce. And at night, he led them by a pillar of fire. And did you know that the desert is cold at night? It actually can get quite cold. And so the fire kept them warm at night. And the cloud gave them shade by day. So they knew that God was looking after them. Now in the meantime, Pharaoh back in Egypt realized, wait a second, now I'm having to do all the work and my own people are having to do all the work. I think we better go and get those Israelites back. We need them to do our work. And so he chose the finest soldiers with their chariots and the horses and they set off after the Israelites to recapture them and bring them back to Egypt. Well, they were, the Israelites were traveling along and they came to this huge sea. And they turned around and looked in the distance and there was the Pharaoh coming with his armies and they were terrified. They said, Moses, what are we going to do? We're going to be sent back into captivity. And Moses said, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Just stand still and watch what God can do for you today. He said, these Egyptians you see coming after us, you will never see again after today. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And the Israelites just thought, we're in a fix. What are we going to do? There's nothing. We've got the, the, the Egyptians coming on one side. We've got this big sea on the other side. There's nowhere to run. But Moses held up his hand 
and immediately a huge mighty wind came from the east and it began to blow the water and separate the water. And so there was a pathway right through the middle of the sea and there were walls of water on either side but a clear path on dry ground. So the Israelites gathered, gathered up all their things and they hurried across and as they looked behind them they could see the, the Egyptians were getting closer and closer. And the Egyptians came into the, the pathway with the walls of water between. And all of a sudden, their horses got stuck in the mud, the chariots, the wheels started falling off and getting bogged down, and they couldn't move. And they suddenly realized, mm. you know what? The Lord their God is fighting for them. We better turn back. We're not going to win this one. And in fact, just as the Israelite, the last Israelite, stepped across into safety on the other side, Moses raised his hand again, and all the waters, the walls of waters, came rushing back into place, and it just washed the whole army of the Egyptians away. The Israelites were amazed. They could not believe their eyes at what God had done that day. And so they put their trust in him. And they realized that God would care for them. And that same God who cared for them and led them through their troubled journey is the same God that we know today, who cares for us and looks after us and leads us through our journeys. So when we're in trouble sometimes, maybe we have a little bit of trouble, maybe we're in a lot of trouble and we're anxious or we're afraid or we don't know what to do, all we have to do is put our hands together and say, God, please help me. And help is on the way. Because God knows what we need even before we open our mouths. And so if we um, are, are unsure about what to do, God will lead us. He'll reassure us that he loves us no matter what, no matter if we've made mistakes, that he loves us and cares for us. He'll tell us the right thing to do if we're not sure what the right thing is to do. And he'll help lead us through our trouble. So when we read his word, when we read the Bible, when we remember how much he loves us, even when we make mistakes, he leads us through our troubles with peace and confidence, just like he did for the Israelites, through what seemed an impossible situation. And God can help us even when we think we're in impossible situations. So when the Egyptians, they stood still and asked for God's help and stayed calm, that's what we can do. We can stay still, we can ask God for help and stay calm, and that's what God can do for us. So check out your activities in the craft bag because there are some activities to do with the story of Moses parting the Red Sea. Um, and We'll, um, there are other stories as well. You can do other activities in the bag. So take a look at the different um, sites that you can go to to see, and they'll sort of guide you in doing the different activities. Um, and perhaps you might like trying the parting of the pepper trick, which <laughs> you're going to see um, if you haven't tried it yet, and it's quite amazing. And our God is quite amazing. So as you're thinking about all the activities and the stories about water and God's provision and care for us. Just think what an amazing God we have. So you can imagine the Israelites being so amazed, standing on the shore of the Red Sea and all of a sudden seeing the waters part. And I've got an amazing little activity here that you'll see in your, your activity pack. Um, if you look under the um, uh, the inserts for the story of Moses parting the Red Sea. And you only need a couple of things. You need a little bit of water, you need a plate, you need some pepper, and you need some dish soap. So all you do is pour a little bit of water into the plate. Make sure that you just cover, fill it maybe halfway. And then you just take the pepper and you sprinkle the pepper all around. Make it nice and straight. So when I take the pepper and I put my finger in the middle of the water, nothing really happens. But if I put a little bit of 
soap on my finger and I put my finger in the middle again, watch what happens. Is that not amazing? That's pretty spectacular. And if you look on the site, if you look in the bag and look at the site, it'll tell you why, scientifically, why that happens when you put your finger in the middle with the soap. So you can be amazed by the things that happen in science and in nature, just as we can be amazed at the things that God does. So if you haven't tried this trick, go and try it. It's pretty amazing. And Bruce, I think you have a song for us. I do. It's a beautiful song about how God makes a way for us when otherwise we'd be up the creek. Mm -hmm. Putting it simply, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my God. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. By a roadway in the wilderness to lead me And rivers in the desert will I see Heaven and earth will fade But his word will still remain He will do something new today God will make a way to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my God. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will be my God. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a way, He will make a way. Thank you, Ellen, very much. Now I have a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, beginning at the sixth verse. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation, for the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. Bruce, can we have a song? Certainly. The song is titled, uh, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, his power is displayed. services uh, about food uh, and I guess the spiritual depth of what we take so often for granted our daily meals uh, and uh, the main emphasis was just to just to marvel that that this food and the gift of food and and meals is divine grace and then to uh, also say that the scriptures are really clear that we're called to share this divine gift of food so that no one uh, goes hungry. And today I just wanted to think a little bit more about uh, meals and food in the scriptures and in our lives as Christians. And as I was thinking about it, I thought of a great, great scene uh, in a movie, popular movie of a few years ago, that captures, really, it's about two and a half minutes long, and it captures much, or almost all, of what I've been trying to say, and will say 
uh, today. And that is a clip from the movie Blindside. Uh, uh, Sandra Bullock, I think, won an Oscar for her role in that movie. And it's a movie about this uh, very wealthy uh, American family that, through a series of incidences, they bring into their household this uh, young man, teenager, uh, who's literally living on the streets and who has had a horrible life to this point, at least in terms of, of material possessions and, and security of shelter and all of those things. He remains quite a happy person given what he has gone through, but he's literally living in the streets and they've welcomed this uh, uh, young boy, young man, uh, into their family. And uh, he hasn't been in their home that long yet. And they're still getting used to each other. And this new experiment in love, which is really what it was. Um, and it's Thanksgiving. And this family loves food. And they love football. <laughs> and of course in the States, Thanksgiving is a huge holiday. And there's some lots of college football games, and pro games, I think, on uh, Thanksgiving. And so Sandra Bullock's character makes this delicious uh, uh, Thanksgiving meal with all the traditional uh, uh, menu items. But they don't even bother. Uh, they don't even go to setting the table. It's bare. Uh, and she announces that the food is ready and everybody gets out of their seats where they're watching the game and dash into the kitchen and quickly fill their plates and they do thank mom for the wonderful food and then they all plump themselves down in front of the TV again to watch the game. That is all of them except Michael. They were calling him Big Mike at this time. And Big Mike had never had a Thanksgiving dinner before. And definitely not with the family. And he took his meal and he sat down at the table. And mom sees this and looks at all the rest of her family uh, eating away in front of the football game. And she turns off the TV and they set the table and they all sit down. They're a bit perplexed at first. Dad gets what's going on. And they say grace. And just as they're going to say grace, they hold hands, including Big Mike's hands. And they say grace. And they say thank you to God for their food. Um, it's a really beautiful scene. Um, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it was the scene of the kingdom of God uh, coming into that place. And they weren't doing anything horribly wrong, of course not. But when they gathered around that meal and when they said grace, their focus was gone from a football game to each other's lives and the gratitude for each other. And the breaking down of the barriers uh, that were between this family and this young man. They were white and wealthy. He was an African American living on the streets. And the meal and the grace and the holding hands was the kingdom of God. It's a great scene. I watched it just before uh, uh, this uh, filming. Powerful scene. And, of course, this was our Lord's life, really, especially if you read through the Gospel of Luke. All the other Gospels, there's meals and encounters that Jesus has with people at mealtime, but it's really a key theme in Luke's Gospel. In fact, some scholars say that Jesus ate his way through the Gospel. He brought the kingdom in through meals. And it's true. It's really true. In Luke's Gospel, um, uh, he's having a meal. Uh, oh, he just called Levi 
to be his, one of his disciples, one of his apostles. And Levi, his response, this tax collector, was to have a huge feast. I guess, wow, I, my life has changed. Now I'm a follower of Jesus. Come on, Jesus, come to my house. We're going to have this big banquet. Well, I guess the Bible doesn't really say clearly why the guest list was a whole bunch of tax collectors, but I guess they were Levi's friends. They were the people that knew him, and they were probably the only people that would eat with him other than Jesus. And the Pharisees see this, and Jesus says, I haven't come. I haven't come for the well. I've come for the sick. I've come for the lost. And I'm going to show that. And I'm going to live that by eating with Levi, the tax collector. And then another meal in Luke's Gospel is of, um, uh, uh, he's at, at the Pharisees' home this time. And I think I remember reading in some commentary that, that, that maybe like, I don't know if this is really, don't quote me on this, <laughs> but I think I remember hearing that in the Palestinian homes, uh, you could see people eating in the, in the, like, sort of like an outdoor patio, I think. Anyway, regardless, uh, somehow or other, this, the Bible says, sinful woman comes into this tax, or Pharisee's home and washes our Lord's feet and anoints our Lord and kisses his feet. And of course, the, the, the Pharisees are flipping out. They just cannot get this, especially at a meal time. You only eat with your own. You would never eat with sinners, and yet Jesus is doing it again. And his response this time uh, is, you know what? If you've sinned a lot and you're forgiven, you're bound to be more grateful than a person who has hardly sinned or doesn't think they've hardly sinned uh, and then hear that they're forgiven. And she's been forgiven much. And she's just saying, thank you. You haven't done a thing for me. But she has. She's given me this warm welcome at this meal. Uh, Jesus is bringing in the kingdom. And uh, uh, just one more. Um, and the Bible doesn't actually say there was a meal involved. Although I think a lot of scholars think it's implied. And again, don't quote me, but I think one of the children's songs about Zacchaeus is that come and have tea with me or something like that. So I think most of us think, and it's hard to imagine, given all the other stories in Luke's Gospel, that Jesus would invite himself to Zacchaeus' home. Zacchaeus is this, again, a tax collector. Nobody loves him. Everybody seems to hate him. Uh, he climbs a tree because he's a short guy and nobody will let him see Jesus. So he climbs a tree. Jesus sees him and says, I'm coming to your house today. I can't imagine they didn't at least have the equivalent of a cup of tea. Um, I think maybe a meal. We don't know. And we don't really hear the conversation either. But we know something amazing happened in that time in Zacchaeus' home. Zacchaeus comes out and says, look, I have ripped people off. I will pay them back. In fact, I'm going to give most of my money away uh, uh, to the poor. And I'm really sorry about the bad things that I've done. And I am delighted and happy by the new life that Jesus has given to me. Um, I mean, this is a story of, of social justice, of, of righting wrongs, and also a story of personal uh, transformation. And uh, in Zacchaeus, and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this household, this person. It's awesome. It's great. It all happens, uh, well, all these stories and more happen around the meals. Um, and like I mentioned last week, I think Jesus, when he wants to tell us on the... Uh, John's Gospel speaks of it. His, his hour has arrived. He has a meal. He doesn't give the disciples a theory or rules or, um, or a textbook 
on what his death and resurrection will mean, he gives them the gift of a meal to enjoy over and over and over again so that in the, the bread and the wine, in the body and blood of Christ at the, at the Eucharistic feast, uh, uh, we, will, we will know Christ's kingdom of forgiveness and mercy and eternal life. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And I don't think that we can limit the value of gathering for meals uh, just to Jesus and just his ministry of teaching and healing and kingdom bringing forth uh, in the context of meals just to him and those followers of Jesus uh, in the scriptures. I think, as I've mentioned before, and this clip from Blindside really shows, uh, is that having meals together is a way for us to share the gospel with others, is a way for us to connect meaningfully and powerfully and profoundly with one another, to really connect and to get to know one another uh, at a deeper at a deeper level. And literally about half an hour before, or an hour, I guess, I don't want to exaggerate, an hour I head of this filming, we had a meeting with uh, an Iranian couple who uh, have uh, been refugees and have started up a new life in Canada. And our church sponsored, and I have permission to retell this story, and our church sponsored them to come to Canada. Uh, and they are devout Christians and they're seeking to uh, share the good news of, of Jesus with other Iranians and all people for that matter. It's a great passion on their heart. And Payman told us his testimony and his story. And he spoke about how uh, he had been healed uh, and, and his brother had been uh, blessed with, through AA. And he had read... Uh, somewhere, uh, I think it was, he said, the 11th step in AA, uh, the, of the foundation of AA in the gospel. But he'd never heard the gospel. He'd never read the gospel. He didn't know what really the gospel was, but he wanted to know because if it helped, if it got AA off on the going, <laughs> then it must be amazing. And I can't remember exactly what he said. But he went on this search for the gospel, and a friend of his, uh, I think, drove by in his car or something, and honked the horn and waved at payment, and said, guess what? Come over to my house for supper. And payment did. And guess what payment received at supper? Besides a meal, but literally the gospel, both shared by the host of the meal in words, but primarily by giving him a copy of uh, the written gospel. And the rest, as you guess you want to say, is history. And it happened at a meal. And the kingdom was advancing in a place where the kingdom of God is not easily advanced and it happened in a meal and you know uh, the prophet Isaiah when he is imagining uh, uh, describing in poetry uh, God's final victory over death and final complete inauguration of the kingdom he describes a meal mm with the best of wines, the best of meat, around the table. He doesn't use this imagery, but it doesn't sound that much different than blindsight and holding hands and praying and peace. And Isaiah says, for the whole world, all nations, all people, it's an amazing image. Uh, will be dining together and death 
will be no more. So, um, you know, I, I just want to keep this very positive, but you know, in our culture, we, we're an awful lot like that family that eat in front of the TV and not around the table, even when we are together. But we often eat at food courts and we don't have a clue who's sitting beside us and we're not the least bit interested. Um, we live in a culture that, that has lost, I think, the real value of dining together. And one of the things we've lost because of the pandemic here at CCSJ uh, is the ability to come together for meals all the time. <laughs> Uh, and when this pandemic is over, it's one of the most blessed things we'll return to, and I'm really looking forward to, is sharing meals together. But especially the, the Holy Eucharist, uh, which is a foretaste uh, of the final heavenly banquet and kingdom. Amen. Amen. Have a song for us, Bruce? Yes, thank you, David. Um, perhaps one that relates really well to what you've just been sharing about. Just that longing for God's kingdom to come. And we celebrate it. We long for it. We want to live in it. The song is just titled, Come Set Your Rule and Reign in Our Hearts Again. Build Your Kingdom Here. Come set your rule and reign
encourage people, take that little song sheet and just cut out the verse and tape it to the bathroom mirror and begin every day by praying those words for our neighborhood and for our church. Nice. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Well, let us pray. Prayer for Sundays. Father of light, yours is the morning and yours is the evening. Let Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine forever in our hearts and draw us to that light where you live in radiant glory. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And a prayer for strength. Eternal God, you create us by your power and redeem us by your love. Guide and strengthen us by your Spirit that we may give ourselves today in love and service to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And a prayer for guidance. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. Guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares, especially all of the cares that come with uh, the pandemic around the world and occupations of our life we may not forget you but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen. Amen and a prayer for grace and faith Lord God the wellspring of life Pour into our hearts the living water of your grace. By your light we see light. Increase our faith and grant that we may walk in the brightness of your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me take a moment of silence to offer our own prayers for those uh, people or situations that are on your heart. And we thank you, Lord, for all your blessings, for the blessings of water, for the blessings of food, for the blessings of uh, our lives, and especially for the blessings of your uh, love for us and our redemption in Jesus. And as Jesus taught us, we are bold to say together, Our I'm Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So I won't be seeing you well, I, probably, I can turn and tune in to CCSJ worship, but I won't be in it, <laughs> and I'll be away on holidays for about a month, and um, Bruce will be leading worship and be in charge of pastoral care and just about everything else at CCSJ, so um, thank you, Bruce. And on that note, Bruce, why don't you end us with a song? I was thinking of a nice cardboard cutout, though, of yeah. you. We could just keep there for the next few weeks. That would be good. Yes, the song that comes to mind, thinking of Ellen and her story of the Red Sea and what it just must have been like to have that experience of being saved that way. And then all your references to people being invited to be a part of the community, the most unlikely people invited to know what Jesus is all about. So the song is, Praise is Rising, Eyes Are Turning to You. Stirring 
face today. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Oh, Oh, uh -huh.